All right, so thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this panel conversation. My name is David, David Kwan. I'm part of the Samsung Electronics Company, and uh, I represent the Home Appliances Organization. So as you guys know, uh, Samsung is a very diversified company doing a lot of different things. And we do a lot of different things in partnership with a lot of different companies throughout the world, uh, big and small. So today, we've invited uh, special guest panelists from industries across the world, uh, across e-commerce, uh, technology, payments, finance, um, as well as social media to give us their perspectives regarding the smart ecosystem, and more specifically, around smart home and smart appliances. So to illustrate that, what I wanted to do was focus on a use case. One of the use cases that we're very excited about from a Samsung appliance and uh, smart home perspective. So having said that, um, <clears throat> Samsung creates a lot of value in the marketplace today. One of the differences between Samsung and the other consumer electronics companies is that Samsung not only creates uh, cell phones, mobile phones, tablets, uh, visual displays, TVs, um, appliances. Uh, we're diversified in a lot of different areas that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, so are you guys familiar with the uh, Burj Khalifa building? Samsung built that. We have a big construction arm as well. Uh, in addition to that, um, Samsung, believe it or not, has a fashion arm, uh, high-end fashion. Um, so they sell clothing, and the children's clothing in this high-end fashion line retails for, I think, uh, $80 for a t-shirt for children, <laughs> if you guys are interested in stuff like that. Um, so highly diversified, but we can't do everything by ourselves, right? Uh, we do a lot of things, and we do a lot of things well, but we rely on the expertise of partners like Amazon, Box.com, Pinterest, the weather company, IBM, and Visa. Um, so we've invited these leaders from these companies to help us provide a perspective about the smart ecosystem and the smart home and how developers can partner with us, work with us to develop new ideas, capabilities, applications, whatever it might be. And through this panel discussion, we're hopeful that we can generate ideas. And following the discussion, we are going to have a Q&A. So um, we would ask that you reserve your questions towards the end. Um, and we'll go from there. All right, so the specific use case that I alluded to before. Um, <clears throat> our smart home strategy starts with the Family Hub Refrigerator. Are you guys familiar with this product? We've got it on display out there. After the panel discussion, please feel free to stop by the booth and check it out. But one of the reasons why we focused on the refrigerator as the center of our smart home strategy is, uh, is listed up here. High frequency interaction, what do I mean by that? Do you guys know how many times people go to a refrigerator on a daily basis on average, family of four? It's about 42 times. 42 times a day. So whether or not you're cooking something and you need an ingredient, whether you're thirsty and you want to get a beverage of your choice, whether you're about to go grocery shopping and you want to see what's inside your refrigerator before you go out, or you're just bored, you want a snack. Whatever the case might be, people interact with a refrigerator about 42 times a day. And that's a dumb refrigerator, one without a screen. So think of the possibilities that we're bringing into the marketplace with this new smart interface. In addition to that, uh, especially here in the US market, the kitchen is sort of the center of the home, right? People entertain there, they have meals there, uh, they gather and congregate there. Um, so it's an area where there's a, a, again, it goes, alludes back to the high frequency interaction capabilities. The long product life uh, in and of itself may or may not be a benefit, um, but in our mind, it really is a benefit. For partners who develop applications that reside on the Family Hub refrigerator, you have access to the center of a customer's home for literally eight to 10 years, the product life. So having access to consumers. 
And then finally, the demographics. When we first launched this product about two years ago, uh, it caused a sensation. Um, the media described it as a brand new category of appliances in the marketplace, a brand new category. In addition to that, when we first launched this device, we had one SKU, one model in the U.S., and it retailed for approximately $5,000. Pretty expensive, right, for a refrigerator. You can get a very nice refrigerator for about $1,500, $2,000, but this thing costs $5,000. And there's actually a benefit to that, to partners. Um, which is that the folks that purchase this type of device has disposable income. High uh, likelihood that they're going to be using things like e-commerce applications, purchasing things online. So demographics that are highly relevant to partners, developers, and other ecosystems. So keeping that in mind, uh, this is what it looks like, and you can, again, check out the real model, the live model on display. Uh, but it's highlighted by the 21 and a half inch touch and voice enabled display. So you can command it with voice recognition. Um, it's got the ability to read things out, uh, verbalize things, and, and you can interact with it in various ways. So from a Benefits perspective, I'm going to skip one of those slides there, but really the goal for all of us is to bring value to our consumers. And we're hopeful that through this discussion, again, we'll generate ideas, thoughts, and concepts, along with you guys, to determine how we can bring better value into our consumers' world. And secondarily, how we can monetize that. How do we create value for our respective companies together? to bring even more better value to consumers going forward. All right, so uh, the final point that I wanted to make is the Family Hub experience. There's four key categories of value that this product brings into the marketplace today. First and foremost, it is a refrigerator, right? So food, food is a key category that we focus on. Whether or not it's inspirations through contents like recipe recommendations or other items like uh, the ability to manage your food items in the refrigerator, being able to view inside of your refrigerator via a companion smartphone application, a shopping list that can go directly to an e-commerce retailer, or other capabilities. In addition to that, family communication is another area that we focus on as well. Um, traditionally, on a normal refrigerator, people write stickies and tape it up there as reminders, that type of thing. You can do that electronically. Let's say, for example, you have a young child that may not have a smartphone yet. They get home from school and they want to let their parents know that they're home safely. They can write a little memo and you can check on that via your smartphone companion application, another form of communication. Infotainment, a lot of people, I said before, entertain in the kitchen environment. There's a lot of music options, including Pandora, uh, Spotify, iTunes, and now iHeartRadio as well. So depending on what your preference is, you can leverage those types of uh, partners to entertain in the kitchen environment. And then the smart home, as the name implies, it's a hub. It's a hub for additional third-party or Samsung-branded accessories like monitoring cameras. Um, you can control those or view those. Uh, we're integrated with a product, or we're soon to be integrated with a product called the Ring Doorbell. You guys might be familiar with that. So in the future, you should be able to see who's at your door leveraging the Family Hub display instead of your smartphone with Ring interaction and other products as well. So keep an eye out for more and more third-party integrations going forward as well. All right, so having said that and putting that framework together, um, the final point that I wanted to talk about is the Family Hub and the Samsung Partnership ecosystem. So we've got a tremendous amount of development resources scattered throughout the world, highlighted by our product team here in the San Francisco Bay Area in Mountain View. Um, the head of products is with us today, uh, Boat, Agbotwala, he's sitting up front, and he manages the development of all of our smart appliance strategies for us. Uh, in addition to that, we've got research centers uh, globally. Uh, depending on where our partners are located, we can host you guys at workshops and do all kinds of fun things there. 
And then the words in blue, those are the countries where we sell the Family Hub product all across North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific, including New Zealand and Australia. And then a list of some of the partners that we have globally. Our partners are, um, uh, these partners, some of them are in our refrigerator today, some of them are in various stages of development and um, targeted to be launching in the family hub within the next six to 12 months. And then recently for developers and partners to be able to better interact with us, we've developed a new interface within the developer.samsung.com website. So if you're interested, please check that out. And if you're even more interested in that, you can register on samsung.developer.com to join our partnership ecosystem and start development. There's SDKs, there's resource materials, there's a whole bunch of other things that um, are beneficial to our partners as well as developers to be able to leverage the Samsung ecosystem. In addition to that, uh, once you start your development, um, there are developer forums for you guys to interact uh, and collaborate together in this forum. And then the remote test lab allows you to remotely access the Family Hub panel to test your application uh, in a remote environment. So the panelists that we've invited, I alluded to. Um, I'm going to allow uh, our panelists to provide a brief introduction to uh, who they are, uh, what company that they, they represent, and what their role is with the company. And then following that, we'll have a brief dialogue uh, with a set of questions that I've prepared for the panelists um, to help start the conversation and um, <coughs> generate ideas along with you guys in the crowd. All right. Uh, first up is Jero Wade Wade, I'm sorry, from Pinterest. Um, hey, everyone. Um, so I run consumer partner product partnerships for Pinterest. Um, how many people have Pinterest on their phone right now? Actually, okay, it's a decent amount. A lot of guys too. Uh, we are a visual discovery app used by over 200 million people uh, a month. And we have over 100 billion pins and ideas for people to discover uh, and do what they love. And so specifically what brings me here today is we have two integration points with Samsung. One is on the Bixby Vision uh, on, the, on the cell phone, we're the default image search um, provider for the Bixby Vision. And then more recently, we've partnered with Samsung on the Family Hub, so you can launch the Pinterest app from the Family Hub device. Uh, obviously, this giant, beautiful screen is attractive to such a visual product like Pinterest, uh, and you can find recipes and, uh, and food inspiration and ideas. All right, very good. The weather company and IBM company Greetings, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Brian Hall. I run the Global Creative Labs for the Weather Company. Um, what we do is we use what I call the ultimate trifecta of data from the weather side, which is weather location and time, combined with the entire suite of Watson API and all the cognitive APIs to create relevant, engaging, uh, effective advertising utility experiences for both consumers and brands. We've done some amazing partnerships with Samsung on becoming the, the default go-to uh, installed application on all mobile devices. And we're exploring a lot of other opportunities across other IoT and ecosystem experiences as well. All right, um, Otto from Visa. Hello everyone, Otto Williams. I lead digital wallet partnerships at Visa and um, work with uh, technology platforms, device providers, and wearables, wearables partners including, obviously, Samsung, uh, Apple, Google, Fitbit, Garmin. And what we've done is we've launched Samsung Pay in markets, Samsung Gear, uh, enabling those for payments as well, and working with Samsung and the Family Hub. I assume most of you here have, if not all of you, should have Samsung Pay on your Samsung devices and <laughs> using, using those to make payments uh, in-store and in-app as well. And that, that's the sort of stuff that we're enabling and working with Samsung to enable Visa digital payments. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Talal. I am the strategic partnerships lead at Boxed. 
not to be confused with Box, the online uh, storage company. Um, we're an online wholesale club um, where we sell consumer goods in bulk. Um, and we've been working with Dave and his team on integrating Boxed into the Family Hub as well as Bixby. Thank you. Right, and Ben. Hey, everyone. Uh, ben Richardson. I lead global business development for Amazon's Dash Replenishment Service, or what we call DRS. And uh, DRS is part of our smart home business, which includes Alexa and the family of Echo products. Happy to be here. All right, thank you very much, guys. So having said that, um, I'm going to enter into our smart appliances panel conversations with a question for one of the panelists. Which one should I ask a question first? Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Brian a question. <laughs> I'll throw you a softball here. All right, so I mentioned that the Family Hub came with a 21 and a half inch touch and voice enabled display, right? The premium feature. Uh, based on that, how do you think that this will impact advertisers' ability to get in front of consumers in a meaningful way? That's a great question. We've been playing around a lot with the panel in, in our various labs in, in New York and Atlanta. It's become a resounding, we all agree that with great screen size comes great responsibility. We have to be very, very, very careful. Uh, we are in the, we would be in the heart of a home, right? the hearth in the heart of a home in the kitchen, and that's a sacred space. And to violate that space with ads that are not relevant, engaging, uh, is exactly the opposite of what we all want to do. And we have to be very, very careful now with technology and the, the perception that we do not have. It's a, a lot of actions going on right now. You're all aware of it. That we do not have the consumer's best interests at heart. And it's of paramount importance that we do. In terms of those ads cannot be just a typical block and tackle ad. It needs to be something that's truly relevant and engaging, or even better yet, personalized. Mm -hmm. Each individual family member. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I had the opportunity to take a look at some of the advertisements that um, the weather company enables on our smartphone devices. It's really very interesting. The way that the uh, uh, advertising platform works is that um, it's called the branded background, right? Can you describe for us a little bit more about that branded background and how that works? That's a great, great follow-up to your, your first question there is, it's the exact same scenario with going to a weather app. You're going to the weather.com, you're going to a weather experience. Your, your determinative action is to get information so you can plan your day, not to get inundated with advertisements. So what we've done, though, is that's the first screen, basically what we call the living room of our application environment, the first thing you see when you pull up. So we need to make sure the hierarchy is very, very clear on how you're consuming that information or there's a way to weather graph or a weekly planner so you can scan really quick and get your current conditions and then plan really quickly with what you're scanning your eyeballs. Then down on the very farthest part in the lower 25%, we have really, really elegantly integrated creative that is uh, changes depending on the weather location and time of day. So it's not uh, insulting or, can, or taking over the user experience that mm -hmm. we're for, right? That determinative action of giving me my weather so I can quickly plan my day, and especially if I'm on a mobile device, if I get an overlay or something like that and I'm stuck in a train, this is, this is now a barrier to entry. There are a lot of places that people can go to get their weather without ads. There's a lot of places people can get refrigerators without ads. So again, very, very careful. But when you turn it into, it all comes down to the value exchange. There's a reward mechanism here if you're engaging with an ad that is relevant, that is personalized. And it's all powered by IBM Watson on the background, right? Watson and, and the weather loca location and time data, yeah. OK. All right. So uh, one of the ads that I saw that I found was really, really relevant and interesting, and um, why we started conversations with the weather company about providing background images, including advertisements um, for the family hub is that, you know, imagine uh, a background a 21 on, on the 21 and a half inch screen. Um, snow is falling, there's a mountain, terrain, and then all of a sudden um, you see sort of a, a Ford truck kind of 
driving across the landscape there. Very unobtrusive. Uh, consumers purchase a family hub refrigerator and they cost upwards of, like I said, $5,000. They don't want to see ads splashed in front of their faces day in, day out. But this is a way that you incorporate advertisements in an unobtrusive way and it's relevant and it's targeted through the power of IBM Watson. So very interesting technology that I think has a lot of relevancy in today's ecosystem and environment. All right, um, I'm going to ask another question. This one goes to Otto at Visa. Actually, it's not a question. Uh, please tell us a little bit more about Visa's vision in terms of the IoT strategy from a payments perspective. Right. Um, so we, IoT is extremely important to us. I mean, this is one that we are very much committed to and we're focused on. And if you think about it, it just makes sense. I think some of the data out there indicates that by 2020, there'll be about 20 billion connected devices. Um, we know that our consumers are shifting from, you know, going into this digital first experience. It's less about paying via plastic and, you know, paying via other digital forms. And so how do we enable this ecosystem? And, you know, we've put in place uh, certain key partnerships, including partnership with Watson and assets to actually enable this ecosystem and bring frictionless payments into IoT. And we, you know, with, with the launch of uh, Visa tokens, and I will talk about tokens in a little bit, part of what we've realized is that with over three billion Visa cards out there, each of you probably has a, a credit or debit card, the last thing you want happening is your sensitive card info being distributed across hundreds of devices that you may throw away, may you know, upgrade next time, or may get lost or stolen. And so what we've done is we've taken steps via Visa Token Service to actually um, remove the sensitivity from that data and replace it with an, a non-financial identifier that, act, that sits on these de devices. And so that way, you could either deactivate, suspend, or delete those identifiers without impacting your primary you know, card uh, data. And so, so one is ensuring that you can actually make payments securely, whether it's via NFC, online, or in any environment that, you, that you're in. And then we've partnered with uh, you know, companies like IBM and Watson to actually bring that to the long tail. And so Watson's got over 6,000 companies connected to it. All of those companies will not be able to connect to Visa directly. And so Watson will aggregate you know, the distribution of Visa tokens to those uh, downstream endpoints. And so that's extremely important for us. And we see that as scaling into this IoT ecosystem. You know, working with Samsung and the family hub, how do we bring payments into smart appliances with Samsung? We've brought payments into, the, into Samsung gear. Uh, these are all, you know, we see all of these as uh, connected devices that drive digital payments. I mean, I, I think what's most important, even from a merchant standpoint, is just noting that we want to remove friction from commerce. We want for consumers, between the distance between when a consumer makes a purchase intent to purchase completion should be as shortened as possible, right? I mean, if, if you want to buy Tide, for example, I mean, you say, yeah, I really want to buy Tide, you can go online, log into your computer, open up your Amazon site, order it, you know, do one click and complete that purchase, or you could just hit the dash button and the distance between when you decided you wanted to buy Tide and when you actually purchased Tide is just one button click away. That's really shortening that, that distance. And that's what Visa wants to do is across all of these devices, how can we securely enable payments completion from the time that a consumer intends that they want to you know, make a purchase or transact? That's very interesting. Um... Uh, we were going to hold Q&A towards the end, but go ahead. All right, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, actually, that's a really good segue into uh, a question for the, uh, the Amazon team, Ben. Um, I know that you guys are sort of the leaders in the e-commerce space, especially in the domestic U.S. market, and you guys have developed a super cool technology referenced to as DRS. Can you tell us a little bit more about your DRS uh, infrastructure, strategy, and vision? Sure. Um, 
who here is an Amazon customer? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, we, we have reached a point at Amazon where we, we think the, some of the best shopping experiences are experiences where the customer doesn't, in fact, shop at all. And that's actually what the smart home vision is uh, at its core at Amazon. And so the ways that we're trying to address that are through you know, rich voice interaction, powerful AI through, through Alexa, but also through this idea of stripping out uh, the friction associated with re replenishing many of the, the products and services uh, that we use in our homes every single day. And so <clears throat> that's, where, that's where DRS was born, is how do, we, how do we take that replenishment and make it frictionless? Uh, you've probably seen in the market, or maybe you own, some dash buttons. Do we have any dash button owners here? OK. So the, the dash button uh, was born a couple of years ago, and uh, it was largely a test. We were you know, working backwards from the customer to understand how we could um, make it easier for them to replenish when they were in the moment, in their house. So contextual purchasing. You're next to the washing machine, you realize that you've, you've run out of uh, detergent, as an example. You're in the baby room, you realize you've run out of diapers, as another example. And so it, it required a test uh, to see if customers were willing to actually change their behavior. So instead of going online, through mobile or desktop to make that reorder, in our case, uh, could we take advantage of something that happened in the moment? So that's, that's where the dash button was born. Uh, and what we've seen is the engagement around the dash button has been uh, substantial. We now have, geez, over uh, 600 individual brands with their own dash button on a global basis. And the engagement uh, for those brands with customers from Amazon is very high. And so with, with, with that sort of hypotheses uh, proven, we looked at how can we actually take that a step further and automate it? So can we move from this one-click repurchase to, to fully automated? And, and, and DRS was born from that, and it's, it's essentially a simple set of free-to-use APIs that we make available to companies who manufacture any type of hardware device that uses a consumable so that those devices uh, can uh, automatically reorder that consumable on behalf of the customers who use them. And so examples of this, uh, you know, you think around uh, areas in your home, there are plenty of kitchen examples. You think of uh, coffee makers and coffee grinders, uh, dishwashers, uh, blenders, chopping systems, pantry storage systems uh, in the home. Uh, filters, uh, water filters and air filters on refrigerators. Those are all examples of devices that use a consumable and that customers really oftentimes don't like to think about. So going back to you know, what, what I originally said, some of the best shopping experiences are those you don't have to think about. We don't think that's the case for all products, obviously. Uh, but for some of those products in the home that we all view as commodities, things that we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis just because, we think there's a great opportunity for those to go away and for devices to now take care of themselves. Transactions happen in the background, safely uh, and securely through Amazon. That's a little bit about DRS. That's very interesting. Um, so one of the other technologies that you referred to was the, um, it's kind of like a zero touch usage experience where devices automatically um, sense when they need something like a washer or something like that. Yeah. Can you describe a little bit more about how those types of technologies work in the marketplace? Because I know you launched some of these DRS auto replenishment capabilities with uh, major appliance manufacturers, not Samsung yet. Um, we're in discussions about enabling that sometime in the future for ourselves as well. Sure. But uh, that seems like a really interesting capability and product as well. Sure. If, if you look at uh, most of the major industry verticals and, and uh, product categories that you can think of that use a consumable, um, the, the largest manufacturers within those categories are really uh, leaning into smart home. And they're leaning into the idea of automatic replenishment, sometimes uh, also uh, supplemented with voice interaction. And so we look at companies like uh, we look at companies like GE, Whirlpool, uh, 
Bosch, P&G, and so forth, all doing interesting. I hate those guys. <laughs> <laughs> all doing, uh, you know, interesting use cases about how they can solve like a real customer pain point around this idea of replenishment. It's a, it, and that's a fair question to ask if you're, do we have any device manufacturers in the audience? Developers of any kind? No? Um, so one of the, one of the questions that, that we always ask ourselves is, how does IoT solve a real customer pain point? And, and that's, that's a good question to be asking because I think it's difficult in some cases to really figure out how a connected device is helping the customer interact with that device uh, in, a, in a better way. Uh, the, and the angle we've obviously uh, chosen is through replenishment because uh, we know that that's solving a, a real customer pain point. And so we've got a multitude of devices in development across uh, various uh, categories through device manufacturers. The thing they all share in common is uh, they have a sensor on board on the device. And the sensor is actually able to track consumption of that device. And so it's very different than what you might think of as a subscription service where you just get that fixed amount every, every month. We have a great uh, successful business at Amazon called uh, Subscribe and Save. It's a little bit different than that in that it's actually based on consumption. And so the, 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 the ask of the customer is very low. Uh, they register for, for DRS when they have that out-of-box experience. You know, they pull their appliance out of the box. Um, they discover it through their smart app. They register for DRS. And we found that as a program, it's very, very sticky. And so it's, it's, it's helping support the hypothesis that customers are looking for delightful ways to, uh, to uh, reduce the friction around replenishment. So hugely sticky program, sort of single digit deregistration rates, which we think is very powerful. So once a customer comes into the, the DRS experience, they don't leave. And so for a device manufacturer, uh, that's very valuable. And for a customer, it solves a real problem of really not having to think about that device anymore. Interesting. OK. Um, so while we're on the topic of e-commerce, why don't we move to Boxed and uh, ask a question here. Um, from Boxed's perspective, um, how do you think smart apps can drive additional e-commerce and convenience for our customers? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a good segue from what Ben was talking about. I think Box in itself, we all have bulk products, right? So we don't sell one box of Tide. You're going to buy four or five or 36 rolls of paper towels. And so that model of replenishment gets a bit more complicated because the model in itself and predicting consumer behavior is very difficult. Um, and so that's why we're at least excited about smart apps because it can better help us assess how consumers buy in bulk. Um, I think a lot of, a lot, when we like try to assess what, how a consumer usually shops, um, when they think about buying toothpaste, for example, they'd rather, they're gonna buy toothpaste the day of and go down to their CVS um, rather than thinking about buying toothpaste in bulk. And so, when we think about smart appliances, I think we're in the same realm as what Ben was talking about, is that it helps us assess um, that consumer trend and in, in when they actually buy the materials. But I think bulk is a bit more complicated um, because it's not gonna be a one-time product where you're gonna be replenishing a um, espresso for your coffee. Um, and so, um, working with Family Hub, I think that's, that's something that we're hoping to better figure out, especially when it comes to the type of consumer, to get more data um, in doing so. Um, and I, I think one thing that we're excited about also from a Family Hub smart appliances perspective is the idea of advertisements, is to better get excited about how we work very closely with a lot of the big vendors. Um, and so when it comes to targeting consumers, um, it is very exciting to us to better understand the type of products they have. And rather than doing, um, say, like a target advertisement for Ford, we can better work with a lot of the CPGs on doing that targeted bulk model um, and using that for smart appliances. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's pretty cool. All right, um, and rounding out the panel, um, Pinterest, Jero Wade. Um, we just recently, uh, we're recently looking to launch the Pinterest application on the Family Hub refrigerator to provide um, recipe inspirations to our consumers um, throughout the world. Um, having said that, um, can you tell us a little bit more about your collaboration with Samsung and the Family Hub? 
yeah, partnership absolutely. program. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out some of the kind of characteristics of Pinterest. So we, we have a lot of food and recipe information. So there's recipe specific companies like All Recipes. Uh, and we're in the same league with them in terms of the number of recipes. We also have this incredible corpus of just imagery and kind of what we call food art, uh, where people wanna, wanna go look at that. So what you'll see is users of Pinterest are interested in either two modes. They're leaning forward and they're kind of searching. They're looking for a recipe to make that week, that night, maybe to plan their meals. Uh, or they're leaning back and they're just interested in looking for some recipe for something that they have in mind, um, or they wanna find something interesting. And it's kind of the, the initial breakdown you'll see is the daily kind of utility use cases of recipes versus like a special event, like a, um, making like a seven layer dip for a football game or uh, a special cake for your daughter's birthday party or something like that. So um, we see this data in our app and, and the, actually the, the Family Hub is the first IoT device that we put a Pinterest app onto. It's one of the first devices we put Pinterest onto in general, aside from maybe the, other, the Samsung phone. Um, and so it's interesting for us to kind of learn how this changes when you have something that on your phone is very, very personalized for you, and now it's used in a hub where there's multiple users. Um, so a phone where you can take it and sit with it and, and browse uh, versus something that's much more contextually oriented around being in your kitchen. Uh, we know the use case is going to be food or entertainment. Um, and so I think we're, we're hoping that this partnership with Samsung, specifically with the Family Home Hub, will help us learn what people use Pinterest for when we have more um, context and also a larger screen. Those are the, the two biggest things. And I think the third is we have a whole suite of visual technology and visual search tools. It'd be interesting to see how that comes to bear. Uh, and then also maybe even um, voice. So th I think it's still early, early for us, but um, kind of like Box, where I think we're using this as a, an opportunity to explore um, what happens when you, when you put Pinterest, which has to date been a very personalized and private app experience, into a different context. That's a very interesting insight as well. Um, both Talal and Jero just kind of alluded to data. Um, so I know that data analytics is something that's on the front of everybody's minds these days. And it sounds like a lot of the companies that are represented on the panel today um, use data in a lot of different ways. Um, does anybody on the panel have any insights as it relates to how data can help improve the customer experience from your perspectives? Anybody? Yeah, I, I can share some stuff. Um, so one interesting thing we get, uh, we have about 2 billion searches a month at Pinterest uh, across text and visual searches. Um, and from this and from people pinning and, and following boards and interacting with pins, we get to see trends. And so some data that is interesting for us to, to see what we can do when we share it out. Um, as we're starting to see like a spike in like vegan recipes, gluten-free recipes, dairy-free recipes. So it'd be interesting to take that knowledge that we have from our app ecosystem and display that in the context, maybe prompt and nudge a user towards a specific recipe. Um, and maybe that could be even be an advertising or branded experience, but mm -hmm. using that data that we have from our often users and exposing that through something like Family Hub. That's just one example. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll add to that a little bit. Um, this is more through the lens of just IoT in general and you know, having connected devices. Uh, the, you know, the huge obvious benefit of having a connected device is, uh, is the telemetry that the, the device spits off. Uh, for your, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of devices that you that you have live uh, in the wild, uh, and that's really insightful to companies uh, that manufacture those devices for, you know, for pretty obvious reasons. Meaning, um, it, they, you know, that data really helps inform uh, product development decisions uh, by virtue of understanding their usage, what devices uh, or what buttons are being pushed on those devices, when are uh, they actually being used. What's the seasonality? What do the outages look like for those devices? Uh, which is all um, you know, extremely helpful. And you know, there's obviously a marketing opportunity there uh, because uh, connected devices and, and that data, uh, the telemetry from, the, from those uh, can help inform 
you know, pretty strategic uh, marketing plans. So some of the some of the core values that we see, you know, companies recognizing as they're as they're investing more heavily in IoT. Okay. All right. So um, I think we need to pause here and step into the Q and A section. I know that there was another uh, there was a question here on this side. Um, did you want to ask a question for the panelists? school I want to set a $200 limit can I set a token where they can go use that on their phone and then that's it so the, the way uh, when tokens get provisioned that's what we call it when it gets stored on the device it's bound to that device and so it can't be used outside of that domain right. uh, and so in that case it's restricted however there is a cryptogram that gets generated for every new transaction and that can only be used once. And that is how you know, security is managed, is a combination of token cryptogram, domain restricted. And so, it, yes, it, the answer is yes, in, in the sense that uh, there is a cryptogram that's generated for every transaction and it is unique and we validate that. And that's how we're able to manage uh, domain restrictions and security as well. Now there are certain token types uh, which, may be used in the B2B supplier space where you can actually uh, send a one-time use uh, card number that's also managed by spend limits and a, a number of other, other parameters as well. Um, it's generally used outside of the you know, consumer use case, but yes, that's available as well. Okay, um, any other questions from the audience for the panelists over here? This is for both the Samsung and you guys on the panel. So you guys working on how to make both, well, sorry, I didn't explain it properly. For example, Pinterest, Samsung, all these apps, what you guys are doing with the Family Hub, you're extending the accessibility to your platform, basically, right? First one from the computer to the phone to whatever device, now it's a screen on the kitchen. But to me, the real that, that's to me only extension of the reach of, of the app. Now, the key point to me is when Pinterest, for example, the, the recipe actually interacts with the fridge itself, right? How do you do the food management with the Pinterest app or with the replenishment from Box or Amazon, right? So how do you guys are going to bring that together? Not only give me access to your app, but now your app is doing something, right? Yeah. Um, so thankfully, uh, we have the head of smart products here with us. Coincidentally, so I'll just give him the mic. I can answer that. Um, so we don't look at these different applications in isolation. So all of these are not siloed apps. Uh, when we work with our partners, we want our app to work across different applications uh, as well. I'll give you a simple example. We have our recipe application right now on the Family Hub. And what it does is, with one click, you can take all the ingredients and just add it to your shopping list. So recipes is now integrated with your shopping list. And what we want to do with the shopping list is, with one click, you want to take everything in the shopping list and send it to an e-commerce site. So maybe to Amazon Fresh, so it can populate your shopping cart. So the applications are open, so you can interact between one app and another app. Uh, similarly, we have our camera application where you can see inside the fridge, and that interacts with memos, for example. I can highlight something in the refrigerator. Let's say I put a sandwich in there. I can highlight it, put a memo on Family Hub, and say, hey, don't eat my sandwich. So all the apps interact with each other, and depending on the partners we partner with, they can integrate with the Family Hub apps or they can integrate with each other as well. So it's pretty open on how uh, you want to work uh, with Family Hub. So it's not closed and siloed. Um, all the apps can actually work with each other. And we want actually a seamless experience from uh, the consumer journey, specifically around food. We want you know, purchase intent, um, buying groceries, making your shopping list, being able to uh, populate a shopping cart and having it delivered all in a seamless experience versus having it fully siloed. I hope that uh, answers your question. Perfect, thank you so much. Actually, we have time for one more question uh, over here, I believe. Um, this is probably uh, directed probably to Boxed and Amazon, but uh, do you see the Family Hub integration and uh, smart fridges and the rest of that 
as a uh, play for customer acquisition or for customer loyalty and retention? Maybe boxed first and then Amazon. Yeah, um, I, I would all honestly say both. Uh, I mean, uh, I think Box and Amazon are at various stages uh, in, in our company growth. Um, I, I would definitely see it as one, um, definitely for acquisition. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think it, the data that we would get from Family Hub to better understand and serve our users would honestly be the most efficient to be to be the most effective um, in an ideal world if you open boxed and you don't have a child i don't want you to see diapers and the only way to make that experience better is through these type of partnerships where you're able to better understand your user um, so quite honestly i'd say both um, uh, where we are right now yeah i, I mean how i would answer that is um, it's less about customer acquisition for for Amazon, uh, you know, we've got a lot of customers, a few hundred million actives at this point, which is great. Um, I, you know, we think of it as distribution. We think of it as an endpoint uh, to, you know, to continue to find ways to to really solve a, a pain point for them in the kitchen. Okay, fantastic. So, in closing, um, I wanted to ask an audience question myself, um, and it kind of piggybacks on a question that. Um, Ben asked earlier, how many of you guys do not have a Samsung product inside your household? Whether it's a smartphone, a tablet, or a appliance, or a TV set? Anybody here without a Samsung product inside your house? Okay, there's a couple, a couple of hands. Um, and uh, I think that's, there's probably about 150 people in here, and I saw two or three raised hands. What's the percentage there? Maybe less than a percent of the population of this audience. Um, I ask this question a lot when I go to partner meetings, and generally when I meet with partners, there's about four to 12 people that I'm talking with. And when I ask these questions, rarely anybody raises that, their hands. So that's the power of Samsung. Uh, we have the ability to get your products, your services, your ideas, in front of customers in a multitude of ways. It may not be the family hub. Uh, it may be some other device or product. But consider that. Consider that as you think about ideas about e-commerce or um, social innovation, better values for our consumers that we can collectively put together and launch into the marketplace. So we have a, a developer website, as I mentioned earlier, um, developer.samsung.com. I thought I'd put it up there, but it's not. But that's fairly easy to remember. And I believe most of our partners have fairly robust developer ecosystems available as well. Should you be interested in working collectively with us, collaborating with us, feel free to reach out to us. We're going to be around pretty much all day today, I think, most of us. Um, so I think we're all open to dialogue and conversations with you guys so that together we can bring better value to our consumers throughout the world. Hey, thank you so much for your time today. I uh, really appreciate your attention and uh, looking forward to speaking with you guys offline. Thank you very much.